All right, what's up guys? So you want to sell your house or you want to buy a house, but you realize you have to sell your house first. Let's talk a little bit about what that looks like and um, what you need to do to get that done. I don't know, Aaron. Today, we're getting going on this cool topic. My wife just gave me the side eye as she walked away going, oh my God, I can't believe you're doing another one of those things. Okay, let's talk a little bit about it. Okay, so everyone in this market, or at least a lot of people that I know in this market who are looking to buy, need to sell their house first. Yeah. Right? Our upgrade type of market, people need to sell their houses. So like, how do you do that? Like, where do you go about it? Like everything too. Like, where does a lender come in place? If you, if you want to sell out of your house, you're getting maybe like two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars and the house you want to buy is maybe six. How does that look like? What time frame? What kind of offer should you be writing? Is even something that you even want to take a hold of? Cause it's not as easy as it sounds. Well, no, it doesn't sound too easy. What do you think about that? Well, I mean, it's, 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 uh, you know, you're not building rockets, but, uh, it's, it's definitely more complicated to sell two homes versus, versus one, obviously. Um, it, it you know, it, it really kind of comes down to two different things. When your offers contingent upon the sale of your property, is it because you need the money from the sale of that property to, uh, complete the, the new purchase? Is it because you don't make enough income to qualify for the current mortgage debt plus the new mortgage debt on the property that you're gonna buy? Or maybe it's a, a combination of, of both of those things. And so kind of depending on what that is will really kind of dictate what strategies need to be used in order to complete the transaction for you. If if uh, you're, the reason that you're going to be contingent is because you need the funds to complete the other transaction, then uh, obviously, um, it, you know, the, the other piece of the income is kind of a moot point. But when you look at, at these things, there are different ways to take what might have been a contingent offer and turn it into where you don't have to be contingent. Um, but if you do have to go contingent, that's not a kiss of death. Uh, there are plenty of uh, transactions that get into escrow and that close where the buyer is having to sell their existing property and the seller that, of the property that they're buying had to accept the fact that they still had a property to sell. So don't think that if, if you're sitting in that box that, uh, that you, know, you, you can't move forward, you certainly can. Um, it, it really just comes down to uh, making sure that all the people on your team, your real estate agent, your lender, um, that everybody's got your, your game plan down and that they're also really great communicators and can help communicate that to the seller, to the listing agent to, to help get you in the contract. Um, yeah. what, what do you think about that, Mark? I think, yeah, I mean, there's different game plans. I mean, at the end of the day, we're in a pretty simple process. If you, you know, they want, they want assurances that you can buy a house, right? They want that, that kind of thing. It's, there's a lot of ways to do it. I mean, I'm running into a situation right now with, with honestly, this amazing couple that I'm looking for a house for in Sacramento. Um, and, and like, you know, we're, we're looking in certain areas and they asked me straight up, they're like, well, we're, we're in the process of selling our house. Um, do we wait to sell our house? Do maybe a 30 or 60 day rent back and come into the market stronger? Or do we, does it make more sense to go contingent? Because if you go contingent in a pre-owned type of market, you might have to give up some stuff. You might have to actually come up to show the listing agent that you're actually, you know, you're going to, you're going to play ball. You're going to basically make it worth their while. And so we discussed it, you know, like, and the idea for them is they came up with a realization and we talked straight up. And I said, yeah, if you come into the market and you've already sold your house and you have cash sitting in the bank, 
you have way more leverage in this market, you know, and it may be a 30 day, 60 day, or even a 90 day rent back is worth it. If you're selling the Bay Area, I'll tell you, these Bay Area buyers will be willing to wait for you on 30, 60, maybe not 90 as much, but you know, it's something that you're seeing more and more and more. Like I said before, I'm calling this my upgrade market where people are upgrading their houses mm -hmm. and contingent. I mean, come on, I mean, how many contingent deals I'm running left and right? Um, there's, it's kind of the way things are going right now, don't you think? Yeah, ab absolutely. I mean, you know, we live in one of the most expensive places to, to live in the country. And, you know, at the end of the day, not everybody can qualify for two mortgages. Um, in addition to that, uh, not everybody has an extra hundred thousand, two hundred thousand, three, four hundred thousand, 400,000, whatever, whatever their down payment is going to be laying around, uh, you know, in the sidelines to use. So, you know, depending on uh, each person's individual situation is going to really kind of dictate what their options are. If if you are somebody that you know maybe you've got a, a higher uh, you know a higher monthly income, um, which means that you have more disposable income to where you could potentially qualify for two mortgage payments. Um, you know some of the the things that we've had clients do in this market is basically instead of you know, if their plan was like, all right, I'm, I've got this house that I own in, in San Francisco, it's worth one and a half million. I owe, you know, 750 on it. My game plan is that we're going to, uh, we're going to take the half a million dollars that, that we can have, uh, an exempt from, from not having to pay capital gains tax as a married couple. And we're going to take that half a mil and put that into our, as our down payment on the next purchase. We're going to keep that other 250 minus, you know, realtor commissions and costs and all that stuff. But we got half a million bucks that we're going to put towards this transaction. But in order to, to get that money, we have to sell our property. But right. let's say that we, we have $100,000 in savings or in some sort of liquid account that we could use to make a smaller down payment. And then since I can qualify for both mortgages, I, I make that smaller down payment. I don't go contingent because I, now I'm going to use that smaller down payment from like, let's say the, the hundred thousand that I, that I had in savings or whatever, 50,000 or whatever it is. And, and I'm going to use that amount as my down. And then after my home sells, I'll take that money. And depending on the kind of loan that I got, um, maybe I can do a recast, which is basically kind of like a, a no, you know, the way to really look is like a no cost refi, really. But basically where the lender, you can make a big giant principal reduction and the lender will update your mortgage payment essentially based off of what you owe. Um, or maybe I take a look at, at my refinancing options at that time um, and, and get that that lower payment. Um, or maybe I just keep all that money in the market or, or whatever the case is. But um, we have had clients that have done that. We also uh, have had clients that um, maybe they, they didn't have to wait necessarily because of the funds, like they had the money for down payment, but they couldn't qualify for both monthly payments. So in order to basically not count your, your departing residents monthly payment against you, we'd have to at least show with Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac that, uh, that your home that you're selling is pending sale, and that the buyer has either released their contingencies or, or that the lenders provided a closing disclosure, um, depending on if they're paying cash or using financing. Um, and then at that point, the lender on your new purchase would let you close, regardless of if you've closed your, your sale or not. But there, there are little, little workarounds, but it's, it's going to mainly come down to how much income you have and can that, can that cover more than one monthly payment? And then do you have enough in funds to come up with some sort of down payment that works within, within those numbers to, you know, make that purchase happen. But if the answer is no to those things, um, then you simply need to go contingent, which like I said, that's not the kiss of death. Um, you just need somebody like Mark that, that understands how to basically, you know, warm up the, the listing agent and, and uh, you know, explain the scenario. Um, Mark, you actually, you brought up a really good point too, is that, you know, if, if I was selling my house and I had a offer from somebody and it's contingent upon the sale of their property and they're relocating here 
from, you know, Tulsa, Oklahoma, um, which Tulsa is a, a great place to, to visit, but the, the housing market's not on fire out there. It may take 60, 90, 120 days to, to sell. And, you know, the, the, the amount of equity that they have is, is not the same as like, let's say that I'm selling in Cupertino and I'm sitting on a mill and a half in equity. And, you know, our market is like a two to three week, you know, close of escrow kind of market. So it's like, that's a much lower risk for me as a seller to take a offer that's contingent when the buyer, uh, the, the home that they're selling is going to move lightning quick. They got a ton of equity, which means that they can be flexible on their price with whoever's going to buy their place. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a lot of, lot of compensating factors that need to be considered. Um, but ultimately your, your real estate professionals, once they have all that info, that's their job is to basically, you know, be the, the mastermind and, and figure out the strategy for you to get your goal accomplished, which is to buy that new house. Totally. totally. Okay. Now here, I'm going to give you guys a little bit of a pro tip right now too. Now, if you're, this doesn't go for new homes as much, but this goes for pre-owned homes as well. This is something that's really, really slick. So if you're someone who's number one, looking to do a contingent offer, it might be also in your, in your advantage to actually mention to the realtor, the listing agent say, look, you know what, why don't you help me pick out a, uh, um, a listing agent for my house? That way you can ensure that it's done by a great agent. And you know, the listing agent will love that because they get a referral fee. <laughs> So how to get that in. So there are little things you got to think outside the box to kind of do to make kind of the deals work. So, okay, let me ask you something, um, Aaron. Okay, so Johnny mentioned, I know some new construction builders won't even consider contingent buyers who have to sell first. Can I qualify non-contingent then turn around and sell my house? Now, for me, I've gotten into, I've had clients, I mean, I've had a lot of clients actually that have actually um, been forced to sell their house within the first three months. And then they're kind of homeless for a certain period of time. They're looking for apartments, Airbnbs until their house is finished. Now in this market, as we know, one of the things that we're seeing left and right are delays. And so that's kind of paying the butt, right? I mean, six month contract for apartment month to month, you know, that's not an easy thing to find. So how do you as a lender, like, let's say some Johnny calls you up and says, Aaron, this is a situation I'm in. They won't, one, they, they might not even let him do a contingent offer, but he, he tells you, you know what, look, I can qualify for it, but there's no way I can deal with two mortgages. Can I get, maybe get, you know, I qualified through their lender barely. Like, can I use you? Can you get me in there? And then before I actually have to get in there, can we sell my, and I sell my house first. Can I put that money towards it? What does that look like? Yeah, you can. So when you get pre-approved for a loan, you're not locked in to what you were pre-approved for. The, the purpose of that pre-approval is to basically make sure that you can qualify for the transaction that you're applying for. But let's say that, you know, like in, in that situation, you got pre-approved. Um, it was with, your, your transaction not being contingent and you didn't have those additional funds. And then all of a sudden you do end up selling your place and you've got an extra 200 K, you know, to put down or whatever the, the case may be um, until you basically sit down and, and put ink on paper with a notary and sign your, your loan documents, the lender can update your, your loan. Now, depending on who it is, they may him and ha a little bit because, you know, they're going to have to update things and, you know, it takes a little bit of work, but in the big scheme of things, I mean, it's no big deal. So there's that, that there's no reason why you wouldn't want to have them update things if, if that were to take place. And then you're just simply, you know, getting the financing the way that you had originally intended on it being. But um, we've, we've had tons of clients. I mean, a lot of these things, they take four, five, six. I was talking to somebody earlier today. They're, they're looking at like March timeframe on, uh, on when they'd be able to occupy. So a lot can happen, uh, between when you get pre-approved and when you're actually, you know, closing on the transaction. So if your situation changes, um, you definitely would want to want to update your, uh, your loan based off of what your needs are, uh, at that time. Very cool. All right. Um, we just put an order for a new house. The house should be finalized in November. When can I start looking for lenders? It seems like our loans seem fairly high, even when covering closing costs. Yeah, that's another thing too you're going to notice is that like 
the incentives to go with the lo- their lenders are kind of shrinking a little bit and they're putting the fear of, you know, GOD in people as far as not going with their lenders because their lenders are so in tune. The house you just got, you know, it could slip out of your fingers if you, you know, like that kind of stuff. I, I would say talk to a lender, get a battle plan in place. You want a lender who's smart, who knows when to lock, if there is a time to lock, who can keep tabs on the builder and has got your back during this whole process. Cause I got to be honest with you, I won't say who, but some builders actually own their lenders. Is that crazy? <laughs> Doesn't seem fair. Yeah, seems they're, they're keeping it all in the family. Yeah. So, you know, how, uh, are they supposed to get your back? Are you supposed to get the builder's back who's giving them a steady flow of income? Uh, I mean, doesn't seem fair in my world. So I would say do yourself a favor and get at least a, uh, another opinion on it. And like I said, Aaron's a good dude. He's not a hard sell, trust me. And so he's, he's good. So, yeah, I would say the sooner the better, get a strategy in place and figure it out for like as far as what you're looking for. Okay. Also, Lenara said they uh, could lock me into a three month loan before close. Would that force me to go with their lender or can I go ahead and change after the fact? Aaron, that is an Aaron question. You can, you can change after the fact unless, um, and you would have to, you would know if you were getting yourself into something like this, but if, if you have a rate lock agreement that you're signing and like, you're either writing a check to pay for that upfront rate lock agreement, or they've somehow tied that, that amount to your security deposit. And there is like a cancellation fee or something like that. Um, unless there, there's something like that that exists, then you don't have to use their lender. You're not tied to that lender. Um, I was actually just talking to somebody earlier uh, today about this exact scenario and it was the same lender in fact. And, uh, and I, I told him, you know, Hey, if, if, uh, if you're concerned about, we were basically talking about the pros and cons of locking and, and, and whatnot. And this, this individual knew that they weren't getting a, a great deal with the builder but they were getting pressure from the, from the builders lender and the builder. And um, they were getting, you know, basically kind of pressed on uh, doing a longer term lock. And so I said, you know, Hey, if it, if it makes you feel better um, and you, you, you don't stress out about it, go ahead and, and lock your loan with that lender. Assuming that, like I said, you don't have to pay like some upfront fee that, that you're going to lose out on if you go somewhere else, but go ahead and lock that deal in. And then continue to shop around and make sure that you're truly getting the best deal. And now you've kind of hedged your bet. You got an insurance policy, if you will. And if things go wonky, you know, you could always fall back on that. But at the end of the day, I mean, there's there's no free lunch, right? There's nothing's for free. So if if you're getting a credit from the builder, there's there's a reason for that. And it all just basically ends up getting baked into the price which you're going to, you know, if you take out a 30 year mortgage, you're going to pay that price for 360 payments or however long you, you, you keep that property. So it adds up over time. So you definitely want to make sure that, that you're getting the best deal available. Um, as far as locking right now, I, I, and again, this is just my own personal opinion. You know, I, I, I could say this and then tomorrow, you know, they, they could shoot up like a rocket, but Everybody in my industry, whether they're a professional, you know, mortgage-backed securities analyst or just, you know, a talking head, um, everybody has been expecting rates to rise. Um, I've said this a bunch of times on the show that inflation is the enemy of interest rates. And although inflation is here, if you were to look at a trending average, like if I showed you a chart with the trending uh, average of mortgage-backed securities of where the prices are going, um, they've actually been trending positively for over like 90 days overall. And so, you know, although they're not dropping like a rock, like they did right after COVID, and then it was, you know, it's like, oh, wow, rates are in the twos all of a sudden. Um, rates are still in the twos. It's just that instead of trending upwards a lot faster than what we we had all expected, it seems like for whatever reason, um, you know, the bond markets just are, are lagging. And so like we, we showed up today and it seems like all of the Caribbean is at war uh, over the weekend. You got stuff going on in like Cuba, the Haitian uh, president was assassinated. I mean, there's like just all these geopolitical things going on. 
And we saw rates have improved. Uh, you know, Friday they got better. Today they got a little bit better. So in a in a positively trending market, um, I, I wouldn't necessarily say that I'd lock in my rate. Now I would have my file ready to lock, meaning like I've got my application submitted. Um, the you know the lenders in a position to lock my rate, whether it's for 90 days or 60 days or six months or whatever whatever it needs to be. Um, but I, I would have my file ready to lock and also be aligned with my loan officer on what my goals are for the rate so that while th this person's watching the market, essentially, um, if things do take a turn for the worse and now it does for sure start trending in a negative way, um, they can get on the phone with you real quick or text or whatever and be like, you know, hey, this is what's going on. What do you want to do? And then you're in a position to take action instead of like, you know, okay, well, I'd like to lock. All right, well, great. What I need you to do then is submit your application and do this and do that. Yeah, I would have all that already done. That way it's just a, hey, I need to lock. Um, but for right now, I'd, I'd see what, what the world has to, has to do as far as things go and see if it improves. I mean, it is <clears throat> somewhat crazy. I mean, I was with you, man. I thought we'd be around three, three, <clears throat> three, four by this point. And all of a sudden we're not, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I would say, you know, there's no guarantees in this world or anything too, but I would say right now, <laughs> that's that, for um, sure. Yeah. You know, right now I, I would probably just say, just, you know, if you're going to buy, you know, I, I'd say take advantage of these rates. I mean, but if you don't buy, everyone's got their own ideas on it. If you don't buy, don't complain. <laughs> <laughs> Don't complain mm -hmm. when the rates go over three and say, oh, man, I thought they were going to drop. Um, I would just say that, like, no real estate market's perfect. And I'd say right now we're in good rates. I mean, it's crazy. Like I said, I, you know, during this time where the lull hits, interest rates usually go up. I mean, and it's just it's not that way right now. And, you know, inventory is coming slowly back to the market as well. Things are sitting a little bit more a little longer than they are. So I would say for you guys, like, just be cognizant as far as the rates where they are right now and just understand that it might not be that way for that much longer. Um, and they might, they might shoot up. They might not, you know, you never know, but at the same time you have right now stellar rates. So it's a good thing. All sure. right. I've heard Lennar mortgage is terrible with terrible customer service. Lennar terrible customer service. No way. No, no way. I mean, honestly, like, Oh, no way. <laughs> Wait, <laughs> Oh, no. All right. Well, I'll just say it, Mark Lennar. <laughs> I know. Well, everyone already knows it. I just don't want to be slapped with a cease and desist for saying anything, even though it's the truth. Okay. Aaron, I'll get in contact with you. Mark, you feel a bit on the edge about, uh, about without an agent having my back on new home purchase. I'll tell you something straight up. And I do this for anyone, you know, even if you don't use our team or whatever, just if you need help, call. I mean, honestly, for me, this sounds weird for a you know, realtor to say, but karma for me is a great currency. So, you know, reach out. We, you know, if you feel itch nervous or anything like this, just let me know. We're totally down for helping people as far as even if we're getting not getting anything out of the deal. Just uh just so yeah, feel free. You Absolutely. Our, I'll look you know, forward to hearing from you, Christian. And okay. It seems sketchy that you cannot pull uh, pull an agent after uh, signing up for a new home builder. Can I ask Lenar to match the rates my broker is providing me? Um, you can, but the truth is Lenar is so full up with business that it might be like, I don't know. It just, it just might be, um, might not be worth your time, but I mean, anything's good. Anything is worth a shot. I think in this market. Um, okay. What should I, uh, what should I be careful for when buying a new home? Should I get an independent inspector? I would 100%. I would get an independent and uh, learn how to talk, learn how to talk. Mm. I would say, yeah, of course, get an independent inspector that works for you. And sometimes the home builders are a little bit picky about that. Even if it's a day after it closes and you got the keys, I'd still bring an inspector to look over the house myself. Um, I would say, you know, keep, keep on them as far as timelines. Um, with Lennar, you know, they do the, the you know, they kind of disappear and then appear and then you have a bunch of times. I would say also that on the visual inspections you go through, I would say take your phone with you and just take shots of all the stuff you want changed. Make sure you're submitting it on an email. Yeah, that's another thing. Okay. Whenever you're working with new home companies, whatever, make sure everything has a paper trail, an email trail, a text trail. Never do anything verbal. 
especially if it's regarding dates of when they're closing and everything too. Make sure it's on an email and make sure it's on a text. The other thing too is, and here's the thing that a lot of people don't realize too, is that um, reviews, reviews are powerful. You know, like understand that like if you're starting to get some kind of, you know, non-perfect service, not, not, you know, bad service, make sure you make it abundantly clear that like you will review their service after it's over. And trust me when I say this, reviews go a long way. So uh, just keep that in mind as well. Reviews are powerful. People don't realize how, how reviews are so, so powerful in our market. They really, mm -hmm. really are strong. They carry a lot of weight. I remember I was working, uh, my first real, real, uh, real estate company I was working with, and um, this one agent had like perfect reviews. And then this one client went on Zillow and just put a bad review. And oh my God, it set him off like crazy. Like the consumer always has the power. It's just a matter of just like realizing what are the pain points of anyone. And, and that's it. Review the service and just say, what's up? That'd be me. All right. Do you, uh, do you see builders lowering prices and lumber costs going down? Here's the thing, whether lumber goes up, whether it goes down, it's always going to be about demand. And now here's the trick about the builders is they're building even slower. The, the building cycle, it's its a slow build cycle. It's even slower now than it was when materials were hard to come by or materials are more expensive. For some reason, it's very much slowed down. If you go in now and look for a new home, they're going to give you like an eight month, eight to 10 month estimate normally. I mean, now, now and again, maybe not as drastic, but it's going they're definitely going to be up in their timetable. So building has gone slower and you're going to see um, less and less new releases popping in as well. They're really kind of trying to figure out what's happening in this market as well. It's nothing against them. I mean, as business people, I would say that that's a smart move right now because you are right. Material prices are lowering. I would say, especially in Sacramento, we're seeing that inquiries are definitely decreasing for the new home builders. They're working off their list right right now. And you know, that's what I would do myself too. I mean, they have thousands of people on these interest lists. So they're working off the mm -hmm. list. And I think right now they're trying to figure out exactly their next move. And I think that that's really going to, you know, push builds a little bit slower. And that's just my own opinion, but it's interesting. I, I, I think the, the lumber costs and, and some of the other supply shortage, uh, you know, issues that that we've heard come up as far as builders go i think that's just kind of an excuse that that they're using to to jack up the prices i, I was i was reading an article last month uh that was uh they were interviewing three or four ceos of like these major lumber uh, mill companies you know basically like the supplier to the builders or to home depot or whatever and they were talking about basically how their companies were just taking it in the shorts because essentially the builders had already locked in the pricing. They, they go like, you know, a year in advance and they go buy all the lumber, you know, they buy all their stuff and they lock in a price ahead of time. And in fact, uh, a couple of these CEOs were saying that uh, going into the future that they were no longer going to allow the builders to lock in the price. So, you know, they, they may have been saying that, you know, well, lumber prices are up and, you know, that, that justifies, you know, these price increases, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they were actually paying more for that lumber. So I think at the end of the day, they're a business and they're going to do whatever they can to maximize their, their profitability because it's a feast or famine industry. And when, when things slow down, you know, they won't be selling any houses at, at a certain point. Yeah, no, no, I agree with you. I mean, there, there is an interesting uh, other part of the market that we haven't really taken into account as well. There's a lot of companies, a lot of people that have actually hoarded materials. And so a lot of them are offloading these materials into the market as well. Like Amazon, I guess, bought like 80% of the market rebarb or something like that. It just crazy stuff like that. So <laughs> we're going to see, that, you know, prices go up, prices go down. Prices, it's going to be, it's going to be crazy. It's like unloading stock at this point. So uh -huh. I do think in the next you know, end of this year, beginning of next year, I think it's going to be an interesting market how it all breaks out. I think the new homes, like you said, I do think like, and I was saying that ahead of time and, you know, it wasn't anything because I, I love my new home salespeople. Like, you know, there's some awesome people out there selling homes, great communities, but I do think that a lot of the, the people who are selling homes that did put this whole material as a reason why house prices were so high and they couldn't, like right now they have a lot of like, they just have to kind of, figure out like, you know, where the BS starts and ends. 
Mm -hmm. because imagine this. I mean, you tell someone, all right, look, you know, the reason why we're charging you so much on your house is because material prices are so expensive, right? I mean, okay, material prices are lower. So it's like, well, okay, you guys haven't started to build my house. So now that material prices are lower, can we make a price adjustment? You know, that's just a common sense thing. Well, no, 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 no. There's still, you know what I mean? So you kind of sure. have to be clear about all this stuff that's happening. Like I said, I do think, like, I do think you're totally right, Aaron. I do think that we could see something crazy happen with the new home space. Um, and it's interesting. I mean, there's all sorts of stuff happening in the new home space. There's also the plus 55 communities. Something that I'm calling ahead of time right on this channel is that like Lenar, uh, Taylor Morrison's new plus 55 community. That's so awesome. Now this is kind of crazy, right? As long as everyone in the house is 18 and they have one person that's plus 55, they can buy a house. Really? That's interesting. That so is interesting. interesting. That's way different than uh, the Dell Webb rules. Uh, it's going to be interesting, guys. Next few months, trust me, it's going to be crazy. Okay. To uh, really uh, to see a real expensive home, do you need proof of funds from your bank? Um, it all depends on the listing agent. Um, for me, whenever we're listing something, maybe over a million, normally we ask for it. Unless the the you know the the agent on the other end translates completely about how their client is like you know some people don't want to show proof of funds some people like are very private they don't want to show the bank account stuff and they they get very nervous so it's all about your your agent that reps you and to be able to like um, to be able to translate that to the listing agent as well especially if you're working with an agent who's in the luxury space like for me normally when i show stuff over a million i don't really well it all depends i mean if we're getting into like the three four five million you know a, you know it's touch and go it always is a little bit more powerful if you can show them something but then again you also wonder to yourself like if a house is for 2.5 million and you're, and you're showing a bank account that has 5 million in it, does it put you in a weaker situation, a weaker leverage for saying, oh, no, no, we only have this amount. So, okay, I guess I'll get off my soapbox and say sometimes. <laughs> so it depends, you know. Um, yeah, just make sure if you're running in that high-end space, you have a luxury agent who actually knows the other luxury agents too. It, it helps a whole lot. All right. Aaron, uh, on New A Mortgage, your website is down. Your website is down, Aaron. Come on. Oh, no, that's like a Aaron Klaus mortgage expert. That's like an old, old thing. I'll have to, I'll have to go back and fix that. But uh, if you go to newwaymortgage.com, um, and, and in fact, we actually set up a meetnewway.com uh, is a landing page within our website and it's got a, a, a calendar app. You can book time with us. Got a couple of videos that, uh, that explains our story um, oh, along wow. with all of our client reviews, but uh, I'll have to go check out that other page and uh, fix that. Appreciate you pointing that out. Yeah. Aaron's always available though with phone calls too and everything too. So feel mm -hmm. free to reach out. All right. So what would your top three builders be from uh, to qualify wait, from quality to customer service? And this is only opinions. This is just how I am. Um, I like Taylor Morrison. Um, I think that they do a luxury product, even though they don't always talk, talk about luxury, luxury stuff. I think if you walk into a Taylor home, um, the walls are very nice and like they feel very substantial. The entryways are very large uh, as well. I think that they build a very nice home. I think that the upgrades I've seen, here's the thing a lot of people don't know about me is um, I was in the interior design space for about like five years. I worked with some of the top interior designers in the world. I'm not even joking. I wasn't one of them. I was doing some marketing and we were doing some business stuff, but I worked with a lot of interior designers that you'll see in architectural digest. Um, and so I know finishes. So when I go through some of these houses and I see the finishes, like the size of the granite, crown molding, where they place the crown molding and all that kind of stuff, I kind of know what I'm seeing. And Taylor, Taylor Morrison does a great product. Now, the other thing I'd love about Taylor is prior to this whole new building boom, um, I would actually have specifically people who maybe like three, four years ago would say, I only want a Taylor Morrison house, not a new house, but a house that had been by Taylor Morrison. So Taylor Morrison mm -hmm. is very, very, in my opinion, it, they're they're a quality builder. Um, their upgrades can be a little pricey depending on which way you go, for sure. Um, but you know, I I like that 
normally you don't have to pay a lot premium unless you're getting a gigantic lot. I like it. Um, I think customer service wise, I think Taylor is a great company for customer service. I've yet to run into anyone at Taylor that hasn't been anything less than awesome. Um, and you guys know me, I will bust someone's chops left and right if they're not as far as this stuff goes, but they're great. I mean, like uh, you got Kelly, you got Shig, you got Ed, you got Matt. You, I, I can name them all. They're like the little rascals, but they're awesome. They're awesome people and they're really good and they, knew, they know their stuff and they really are good with realtors as well. Um, you know, it, so I like Taylor. Taylor's probably like my top builder. Um, the other builder I like is Beezer. Um, cause Shannon is just awesome with customer service. And I think Beezer does do a good home. The thing about Beezer, okay, now here's the thing a lot of people don't know about Beezer Homes is that um, they do this thing called a full wrap, right? They add a little layer of insulation in the houses. What I mean by that is if you look at their homes before they actually put on like uh, the, you know, the outside, the stucco area, the stucco and stuff, like they do an entire wrap. So you don't see any two by fours outside the house. So it adds in the insulation and the energy efficiency of that is really, really good. So for me, Beezer, I like them as far as a customer service. And I'm not saying every single person at Beezer, I've been like, you know, but Shannon, Jody, there's a few people that I've run into that I really, really like at Beezer. Uh, there's some people at Beezer that have been a little abrasive, but at the same time, for the most part, Beezer runs a quality shop. Their product is very good, energy efficient. Um, and the price point tends to be a little lower than Taylor. So I like it. Um, so Beezer is probably my number two crud. Number three, who would I go for? Number three, um, Lenar. huh? Lennar. I think Lennar puts out a good home. You know, I think, um, okay. Yeah. I'll give, I'll, I'll give the, uh, the big blue beast, um, it's due. Um, one of the things I will say about Lennar that I do like is the fact that, um, the price that they sell the homes for is normally the price you're paying out the door. And I respect that, right? I respect the idea that some people, when they go into other builders, they feel a little bait and switched as far as like, oh, there's a lot premium. Oh, upgrades. That's crazy. Um, so for me, yeah, Lennar, I like their model as far as like saying, hey, the house is 460. Okay, you can upgrade flooring, you can upgrade a few other things, but for the most part, that's where the price point is you're going to be around. So Lennar does have my vote for that as far as their, their model. Um, and going back to Beezer real quick too, the thing I love about Beezer is like their homes, like you go to their like their their model of models, they're one that's supposed to be decked out. And it's, it's decked out to about maybe 26K. Mm-hmm. You go to Richmond, their models are like $110,000, $120,000 upgraded. You know, like Taylor the same way, Woodside the same way. Beezer, you go to their like most amazing model. This model, it'll make you drool. And they're like, nah, it's about $26,000 as far as upgrades. So the upgrades at Beezer tend to be a little bit more affordable as well. Those are my three. What do you like, Aaron? Which ones do you like? I, I actually, as, as much as I like to beat up on them, I, I think Lennar puts out a, a really great product. I, I like the like what you're talking about, the all in. I, I forgot how they market it, but it's like a all inclusive, uh, you know, deal where your solar and, and all that stuff's in there. I've also noticed a lot of uh, I've had a lot of clients buying with TriPoint lately. Um, I, I haven't really dove in too much as far as like, I haven't walked through any of their models or anything, but as far as like what I've seen on their websites and what I've been hearing in terms of feedback from the clients, it seems like they've been pretty happy with those too. Well, the thing with TriPoint too is, um, I think it's a marketing thing. So I'm not saying it's a quality thing, but I do think TriPoint, their marketing is a little, is not, is not really, they don't put a big hardcore press on the marketing. I think people look at TriPoint sometimes they'll go to like, you know, Folsom Ranch and they're looking at maybe Taylor and then they see, oh, hey, TriPoint's building here also. So I don't think mm -hmm. TriPoint marketing is really like hardcore, like Lennar, Taylor, Woodside, they have really good marketing. I mean, the it was, I mean, when Woodside did that whole like St. Jude's house giveaway, you know, uh -huh. not only did they do something great, but fantastic marketing. And so for like, you know, for me, I look at the marketing aspect of it. I think that like, even though the market is crazy right now, new homes are hard to come by, you know, I do think marketing um, is something that they're a little soft on, you know, like for example, like uh, Richmond American and Rockland, right? A lot of people don't even know that there's two Richmond American communities in Rockland. And so I think the one at Whitney Ranch is so 
strong and everyone loves that, that they forget about the other one. And, and I think the marketing is, is a little bit weak when it comes to the new home companies, my, in my own opinion. Hmm. I didn't so, even know there were two in Rockland. So there you go. See, there you go, man. And then you, you know, you have other builders too. And I don't mean to knock any builders, but at the same time, you know, you have your patio home builders as well. I think Blue Mountain, I think they're they're a good great bang for your buck. And you know, I like I like Kahov because they build on like huge lots. I mean, that's that's crazy too. Um, you know, so I think also, but for customer service, Taylor really, really set the bar really high for me. And I've gone to almost every, I, I have people registered at almost every single builder, but honestly, like Taylor, it's just, it's not only just, it's one person or two people or three people. It's just consistently consistent people, like, like consistent. And it's like, that for me says a lot about a company. So for me, as far as customer service, um, yeah, I'm a big fan. Would you buy or lease solar? Also, can you replace solar after the fact if you lease? Aaron, you want to get that or you want me to? Ooh, man. So would you buy or lease solar? I I guess part of the, the question would come to how long are you going to plan on being at the property? And then something to consider as well is if you are going to replace the solar after, after the fact, um, you, what are, what are you going to, like, are you going to put in a new system or are you going to have to replace the roof? Like, what are you going to do with all the, basically all the holes that are going to be created from the existing solar? And based off of those two things kind of weighing out your, your costs, I mean, obviously leasing is probably going to be cheaper, like on a more short term vision with it. But over the long term, you know, typically owning something is cheaper than than leasing something. Um, just kind of ultimately depends on, on what, uh, what you're, how long are you going to be there really? Yeah. The other thing too, I will note this and I've actually had clients that have told me we were going to put an offer on a house, but the solar was leased and we have to apply for the solar lease. And it, it just, it's not what we wanted. And so, you know, although it's not really a scary process and it does make sense to do it, the, the lease does throw a little kink in the system. Like for example, right now um, I'm closing a deal on, on a Lennar home in um, on Buckeye. And that's one of the things that we had to kind of go through a little bit more, a little bit of a hassle to deal with it. It wasn't a big hassle, but it's definitely something that's not as easy if the solar was owned, the solar owned it's easy, easy peasy. So I would say also another thing too, is I would say, talk to the builder that you're going with and find out what, energy costs are to people who've moved in there and just do your price comparisons, do the Pepsi challenge on, you know, own versus lease. But I think in my opinion, if it comes close, buy it. Yeah. I was, the only thing I was going to add is if, if I were to say avoid one thing is I would avoid doing like there's a, they, they have a bunch of different acronyms for it, but there's like the pace loan, there's the hero loan, um, which, which is like the property assess clean energy. I forgot what the other one stands for, but it's basically like a financing tool used to pay for, for solar, um, and other, other, uh, energy efficient upgrades. You see this more so on the resale market though. So what I was going to say is if, if you are purchasing a home and it does not have solar when you buy it, um, I'd recommend that you do not um, buy a solar system using Pace or Hero or Y Green or one of the you know basically what what ends up happening is you it's it's a little bit cheaper on a monthly basis but what they do is they build the cost of that whatever the solar is gets built into your property tax bill which there's some benefits to that however when you go to sell that property unless you're just going to be here forever when you go to sell that property. Um, the buyer of the property, they're going to have trouble getting financing because essentially that uh, solar lien will take first lien position on title. And I try not to get in the weeds here, but basically Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, FHA, they don't they don't want to be in second position. They want first position when when they take title. So um, you can't you can't really subordinate to the tax man. So um Stay away from those, uh, the, the pace, Y green, all, all those. If, uh, if you are going to go pick up a new solar system. There we go. All right. St. the St. Jude house is flipped right after they want Yeah. I kind of figured it would be all right. 20 years for the solar lease. Interesting. Yeah. It, it's about that. 
All right. I don't like new home builders using their own solar companies. Yeah, that's you know the big blue monster again. Uh, and buyers know say which solar provider they want. I, I don't like that either. I think that's completely like that's just so bad. Do you know what I mean? Like, can you imagine if you buy a house and they're like, yeah, you have to have AT and T. You know, uh, you, you can't have any other. Inter- you no, know, no, no. AT and T is the only one you got to get. If if you don't get it, you can't buy a house. I mean, that's just, there's something really fishy to that. Hopefully that changes sooner than later. But unfortunately, if it does change sooner, then the competitive pricing might make everyone who's, you know, got solar not really that happy. So it's going to be interesting how that whole thing rolls out. I'm even wondering how they got that pass in the first place. You know what I mean? It's like all of a sudden we were like, all right, solar 2020, every new house has to have it. And uh, let's do it really quick so people can pair up. I don't know. I, th- I think they brokered that deal at the French Laundry. Yeah, totally. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, how, I mean, that's so bad. Do you know what I mean that's like so bad? Imagine that you're like, you love this house, great. This is a solar provider. You got to lease it. You got to buy it. Well, can we go with Tesla? Well, you can add Tesla panels, but it's outside of what you got to buy with this solar company. Yeah, Johnny, my friend, you and I are on the same page. I've been mean, wanting to actually do a video about that and kind of interview some solar providers who actually weren't paired up and see what they have to do. And also do a little bit of a price comparison as far as what people are paying for the solar lease they're buying as compared to other solar companies they could they could have gotten as well. But the, you know, I mean, yeah, the solar thing for me is just, I, I, was, I was on that kick for like six months ago when I heard about that. And, um, you know, I'm not saying all the solar companies people paired with are bad. I'm not saying that at all. But when you're the only game in town and that's the only, you know, you're, when you're the only game in town, you can pretty much set your margins. You know what I mean? When it's like, it's me, my way or the, I mean, you could kind of set your price. So I'm, I'm sure. curious, you know, so, you know, it is what it is. And I have a couple of friends over at, or is it at KB who are like saying like a client walked in, this is hilarious. So I got a client who walked in. And he was like, yeah, he's like, hey, what can you tell us about your solar company that you pair with? He's like, they're not the best and they're definitely not the cheapest. (laughs) Straight to his face. He's like, but if you want the house, that's the one you got to go with. Yeah, it was funny, man. I was laughing. I was like, oh, my God, that's just brutal. All right. I think uh, power walls, batteries for homes are going to be massive in five to ten years. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, I think I think there's going to be some crazy, crazy developments in in energy and all that stuff. I, I mean, I think right now we're on the tip of something like solar. As much as um, how can you say, it? as of 2020, that that was our starting line too, as far as that kind of stuff goes. So, can you imagine having this big bulky solar panel, and then in five years, all of a sudden, you can have solar that does even more than what you have, and it's tiny. <laughs> there's gonna be some crazy stuff happening. Well, it's like it's like, uh, you know, solar is kind of like in the flip phone stage. You know, we haven't even made it to iPhone status yet. Right. Oh, no, not at all. I don't know. I got I, I think I probably have to take that windmill off my roof. It's, just not, <laughs> it's not working. All right. Hold on. They're charging 1470. Oof. Man, well. All I'll tell you is this, you better be able to put that AC on all of the time and still be fine with it. I mean, that's that's a lot for that. Yeah. Hi, Lenar, Lenar, Lenar. And I, I heard Lenar owns a piece of their solar company too. So that's interesting. That makes sense. So, all right, guys, thank you guys for tuning in. Um, Aaron, anything else you want to add about the contingent deal? Any Any pitfalls that you see that we haven't covered? Uh, no, I, I just, you know, I'd, I'd encourage you that if, if you are somebody that you've been holding off from taking action, cause you, you know, you just, you, you feel like it's going to be too complicated or you don't know where to start, um, or that, that the, the seller is not going to work with you cause you got to sell your house. I'd say, Hey, you know what, come, come talk to Mark and, uh, come talk to us and, and, you know, we can walk you through a strategy that, you know, may work out really well for you to where you can achieve your goals now versus, you know, waiting six, 12 months, a year, you know, whatever from now. Nice. Nice. And also guys, I'll be releasing some model tours of the new Taylor Morrison active community plus 55 community in Lincoln. It, kind of blew me away as far as the idea that plus 55 there's like you know a whole 
it's really cool. It was really a cool area of Lincoln. I really liked it. Um, and the models are nice. The prices aren't bad. I mean, the crazy part is now check this out. This is crazy that there's actually a house there of floor plan, 3000 square feet. Wow. Now think about, well, think about this community. Okay. It's like active plus 55. This is the downsized community, right? If you're downsizing to a 3000 square foot house, what did you have before? You know, that's, Kind this is the same thing. place where, where uh, only one person has to be of age and then everybody else can be 18. Yes. So they're kind of like, they're probably marketing to this, this whole multi-generational movement that, you know, we keep seeing more of and, and definitely hearing a lot more about. I mean, honestly, like literally like it's, it's, it's going to be an interesting kind of community. I mean, it looks when you walk into the sales office, it looks like, you know, like Waterworld USA. I mean, it looks resorty. I mean, it's really, really nice. And these floor plans, even the smaller ones are like 1560 or 1700 square feet. They are nice. They feel very, they, they feel like over 2000 square feet. They're really, really nice laid out beautifully. The backyards are big enough too, like big enough, not big enough for a pool, but maybe like big enough for like, like maybe like 15, 20 feet deep. Nice. I was super yeah. impressed by this community. I was like, this is awesome. I mean, so impressed that I actually thought to myself that I actually might bring my mom up to take a look at this community because wow. she's looking to move somewhere. Like that was crazy. But this Taylor Morrison for plus 55, super cool. And not to mention the idea right now that it's so hard to find a, like a new home or even to get in contract. You know, it's like the idea that, hey, look, if, you know, we want to, you know, move mom into the house, well, why don't we just get a house? You know, and mm -hmm. mom can move in, and then we're all there. And as long as we're all over 18, it's good to go. And so that's kind of crazy. So this community really blew me away. And I'll be starting to launch some model tours starting uh, tomorrow morning at eight. And so check them out. Tell me what you think. Aaron, how's the show going? Show's doing great. And uh, make sure to check in this uh, this week, 6 30 after your show. We're going to be talking about the four C's of lending. I like it. I like it. And on ours, we're talking a little real estate market. How's it going right now? We are getting a little bit more inventory. Things are sitting. We're also going to probably talk a little active communities, talk about any new communities coming out and what's been going on in the new home, guys, new home market. So that's it. Aaron, next Monday, I'll see you here. Sounds good. Take care, guys. All right, guys. This is Sacramento Real Estate.